My challenge this morning is, in 20 minutes, is to help you change. So hold on to your chairs. Right? The specific goal is to help you change your mind, change your mental model of what we mean about behavior change. Because the dominant model in the U.S. is still an action model. And we see people changing when they take action, like starting to exercise, cutting trees or trimming trees that would threaten their power or their houses. We're entering a season of change with New Year's, and unfortunately, we still give people only two choices, take action or do nothing. And for the majority of Americans, neither one of those are good choices. Because if they, do, if they take action, more than 50% will fail within 21 days. If they don't take action, they'll go on living high-risk lifestyles. And so we need to take and look at models that can help many more people to change. Okay, we're going to look at what's called a trans theoretical model. It's a model of intentional behavior change. Uh, and it's a basis for developing interventions to help people uh, change. And it describes how people modify problem behaviors, that is, get rid of current risks, or acquire new behaviors that will reduce their risk. Today we'll take and be uh, applying the model primarily to adaptation to climate change. We'll take and look at changes at different levels. We'll look at and different groups will be focusing on levels of individual, interpersonal, organizational change, community change, or larger social change. Let me give an example. For those who work on changing organizations, a study looked at uh, companies, 400 companies looking to change, make uh, major organizational change to enhance their companies. Of those 400, only 25% reached their goals. Number one reason for failure for these organizations uh, to not reach their goals. It was not a lack of money, it was not a lack of talent, Number one reason was employees' resistance to change. And part of that is, is because they would come in, try and impose action on a population of employees that not, were not ready to take action. And so we will take and look at an alternative paradigm that was taught to us by a thousand ordinary Rhode Islanders that allowed us to follow them for a year as they were struggling to get free from the most deadly and, and difficult of addictions, namely smoking. And they taught us that change is a process that unfolds through progress over a series of stages. And we will see how we can apply this stage model again to help people that historically we would not expect that we could help. We'll start with pre-contemplation. This is a stage in which folks are not ready uh, to take action. Historically, we call them unmotivated, we call them resistant. In health, we call them non-compliant. We also call them not ready. We now know it was us who were not ready to match their needs. It was us who were not motivated to have our communications, our interactions, be able to help them progress. And so with the new mental model that we'll be encouraging you to appreciate at least and to understand, if not to adapt, think of change as progress rather than as immediate action. We'll take and uh, look at somebody in pre-contemplation where they're not intending to take action. Often misunderstood as meaning they don't want to change. Example, in the U.S., Still, after 40 years of smoking, the number one public health problem, 40% of smokers are in pre-contemplation, not intending to take action. 80% are not ready, but over 80% want to change. So don't make that uh, mistake. What's some of the characteristics of these folks? One, they're likely to be uninformed. It's certainly true in the area of adaptation. But let me apply this to the couch potatoes. There are millions of Americans who are couch potatoes who cannot imagine that their couch could kill them. The head of the health department a few years ago, using this model, communicating to these folks, asked by Channel 6 for a 30-second spot. She said, run this story. Man killed by couch. Okay. Details on the 6 o'clock news. 
she knew how to communicate to that segment of the population, and the goal was to help them to start to be thinking more seriously about changing. Folks can be in this stage out of demoralization. So millions of Americans have tried to lose weight many times in many ways. Their history says they want to change, but they've given up on their abilities to change. I expect there are some folks in here who are demoralized about being able to get their stakeholders to take action. And one of the things that our own mental models can demoralize us, because if we're working with somebody who's in pre-contemplation, and our goal is to get them to take action, we will fail, and we will become demoralized. If our goal is to help them to progress to contemplation, we have a much greater chance of succeeding. And so we need to be assessing our interactions, our communications, our campaigns, by whether they help people progress, because if they move one stage, we know we'll about double the chances of taking effective action in the next few months. If they move two stages, we'll about triple the chances. Historically, we would call that failure. And then there are those who are in denial as well. Let me just share with you and, and uh, uh, be very open. When I started working on this project, I was in pre-contemplation for almost every behavior that this team wanted me to change. Okay? And I'll share with you the progress that I have made uh, over time. In contemplation, here these are folks who are seriously intending to take uh, action in the next six months, but frankly, typically without our help, less than 50% will take any action in the next 12 months. Why? Because they are characterized by doubt. When in doubt, don't act. That's the rule of Wall Street. When in doubt, don't invest. And historically, the tobacco industry, all they looked to do was raise doubt about the science. They knew they could not disprove it, but they knew as long as they could produce doubt, that would slow down change, that would keep people stuck in this contemplation stage. And so doubt and delay, even though the intentions are there, again, without further help, and we'll see the kind of help we can provide, likely to be stuck in this stage. Those in preparation are intending to take more immediate action. Now, if you're working with organizations, you may use different time frames, like in contemplation, in the next 12 months. So you can adjust that time frame depending on the kind of change that you're talking about. These are folks, historically, we talked about as motivated. These are folks who, if we're doing action campaigns, are the folks that we will have a chance to succeed with. But historically, in most problem areas, they make up less than 20% of a population that needs to change out there. And so again, if our communications, if our campaigns are action-oriented, we will basically be influencing these folks who frankly need the least help to progress. Okay? And here, Concern is, when I act, will I fail? Will this action be successful? Uh, the more uh, confidence I have, the more likely I am to move ahead and to, to sustain the kind of efforts that it takes to keep progressing. And am I adequately prepared? Okay. And with action, this typically lasts about six months. It's the most demanding time where we have to work the hardest to keep moving ahead, to keep progressing. After some period of time, six to 12 months, depending on the challenge, we're into maintenance. And here we don't have to work as hard, but we still have to be prepared for challenges that may cause us to say, this is, uh, I'm not gonna make it, and to give up on our change efforts. Okay, so we take a look at uh, our progress across these stages for exercise, and then we can take a look at it for one of the behaviors like preparing for flooding uh, with uh, first thinking, then buying, then uh, implementing action that can help us uh, reduce uh, the risk. Uh, it, it goes beyond stage. We'll take a look at uh, decisional balance, the decision-making process that people uh, use to take and progress towards effective action, and their self-efficacy or confidence, and a little bit on processes. First, in terms of decision making. Here, uh, complex decision models we have found can get very simplified down into two basic constructs. The pros of taking action and the cons of taking action. 
And we can take in and assess those with a very small number of items. If we look in terms of exercise pros, more energy, sleep better, more productive at work. Uh, con <coughs> takes time. Number one con for people in the U.S. practicing uh, regular exercise is time. It's the number one con in Taiwan, it's the number one con in Mexico, and it's the number one con amongst retired Americans. Here we take and say in terms of uh, with adapting, pros, uh, protect our, our property, our home, uh, reduce community burden, save money in the future, and cons, again, taking time, money to adapt, may not be worth it, uh, and so, what's that balance? And so one of the things we see is we need to help folks appreciate the, the pros more, and we need to see ways of uh, reducing the cons. Uh, this is an amazing meta-analysis across 125 studies, looking at the pros and cons of changing across the, the uh, stages of change. And what we see is, and this is from 10 different countries, nine different languages, Great variability and yet a very elegant pattern. Well, that doesn't seem to be working. What do we see? We see the pros going up across these uh, behaviors. We see uh, the cons not coming down into contemplation. Uh, but one of the things I want to have you be clear about, we only see this pattern when we control for ease of responding. If we ask smokers about the pros and cons of smoking, all, almost all smokers would say, of course the pros of quitting outweigh the cons. But when we control for ease of responding, then we see a quite different pattern. Implications of this. Much of de human decision making is nowhere near as rational, as conscious, as empirical as economists historically taught us. Okay? The three Nobel Prize winners in psychology have all been in behavioral economics where they have clearly demonstrated that economic, financial decision making is much less conscious, rational, and empirical than what we used to think. And one of our goals is, is to help this become more of a conscious process, more of a rational process, more of an empirical process. Give you an example. All right? when, when I learned that one of our goals should be cut trees that, that put our power and our houses and our cars at risk, I was clearly in pre-contemplation. I live in the woods, I have watched my trees grow for 40 years. I have an incredible emotional attachment to my trees. And so I have to deal with that issue. Now one of the things that helped was when I had somebody come over and look at my trees, I learned that the trees that are most threatening in my property are beyond their expected life. <coughs> And so one of the things that I was not going to be doing, I was not going to be shortening their life like I might have thought. Frankly, I also learned from Isaac that in some of the storms that we are likely to have, I won't have to worry about cutting trees. <laughs> they will all go down. Okay? And so here I'm worried about taking and cutting some that are the highest risk when I'm faced with the fact that I may not have any trees left uh, if I... Um, with a, a big storm. Okay, uh, so uh, what we look to do is also in terms of increasing confidence. How confident am I uh, when I am stressed, when I am tired, when I don't have a work buddy, when I am busy, the biggest challenge. How about in terms of with adapting, when it costs me too much money, uh, when I can't find people to help me, when I think about the uncertainty of damage. I had to face the fact that uh, with the, the, uh, the worst uh, flooding recently, my road back to, into the woods went up three feet of water. If I had not woken up at one o'clock in the morning, I wouldn't have been able to get my cars out for a couple of weeks. I would have been stuck without uh, uh, transportation. I had to then say what I had learned, build up, build back, don't build. Am I going to take and invest in raising that road up? Well, from my own evidence, from my own experience, that had happened 30 years ago. If I now look and say from a financial perspective, if this doesn't happen for another 30 years, it's not going to affect me. I'm not going to be here. 
Okay? On the other hand, I've become convinced that it's likely to happen much more frequently, so investing that money is likely uh, to be uh, paying off uh, as well. So there are ways that we can take and affect these. I mean, for example, if time is your biggest barrier for regular exercise, consider that you can get more than 60 benefits from 60 minutes of vigorous exercise a week. It is the bargain basement of behavior. Do you like bargains? Okay. This is the behavior for you. And how long will you take driving around the mall trying to get closer to the bargain? Okay. So, think. I mean, I did not realize that most of my big trees were at the end of their lifespans. Once that happened, that I learned that, then, again, the cons of, of cutting some of those trees went down uh, dramatically. So, confidence goes up more in terms of preparation or action, and the more confident we are, the more we can handle challenges. Um, okay. This gets a little more complicated. I just want to focus on a couple of these and finish up on this uh, segment. Different processes at different stages. For people unconscious in, in pre-contemplation who are not intending to take action in the foreseeable future, first thing we do is raise awareness. That's part of what this meeting is about, to help increase consciousness, education, information. This is most helpful at pre-contemplation. In the 1970s, we concluded education does not change behavior. Why did we conclude that? Because we measured it by does it lead to immediate action. Education leads to contemplation, and that's the way we should assess its effectiveness. We concluded that fear doesn't change behavior. Why? Because it doesn't lead to immediate action. Do you believe fear doesn't change behavior? Of course it does, but it doesn't lead to immediate action. It produces progress. And then we also look at how will my change affect others, not just myself. So if I, as a homeowner, the more I do, the less I have to call on uh, uh, public uh, 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 support during times of bad storms, the more I'm helping in terms of that part of responsibility. Let me show how in 30 seconds, mass communication, media campaign in California. I was flown in overnight. The fellow from the LA advertising agency that was running this campaign kept saying, I cannot believe that a multi-million dollar media campaign in California is being driven by ideas from Rhode Island. <laughs> it just didn't match his California LA image. And I said, well, when you're from the smallest state, you have to think big. And here's an ad that they came up with, social ad, targeted towards those in pre-contemplation. Man clearly in grief saying, I always worried that my smoking would lead to lung cancer. I always feared that my smoking would cause an early death, but I never imagined it would happen to my wife. And then on the TV, 50,000 deaths a year in the U.S. due to passive smoking. 30 seconds, three poignant messages, three sophisticated change processes below the surface, and evaluated as helping that segment, many more of them, to progress towards uh, contemplation. So, one of the things that we'll be working on today is how to take and frame messages that can take an impact on people in different stages that you might be working with or that we might be working with. So let me take and, and uh, stop at this point and open up for any questions, comments.